it's magical May and we've returned to Skylark's Garden in Kent where there's an atmosphere of abundant promise and a verdant palette across a spectrum of freshly emerged greens. And even the grass pathways around the borders and central meadow are long and lush because it is no mow May here in the UK, a way to encourage greater diversity of wildlife in gardens. The Skylark's newts approve of the long grass. This bountiful garden was created from scratch by Gertie, Rex and Ellie. There's a link below if you'd like to know more about their story, passion and sheer hard work. And in this budding season so electric with expectation, we explore not only the main garden with its trees, beds, the meadow and pond, but also the front garden, which has a charming personality all of its own. which is where we'll find Safi later on. So I'm back here at Skylarks with Ellie. Hello. And Gertie. Hello. And Rex, hello. Hi Rex. <laughs> Looking around your garden, it all looks so lush and everything's just waiting to burst yeah, out, isn't absolutely. it? Absolutely. It's like you can always feel the tension. Yes, yes. the anticipation. It's, it's tangible. What are the, your favourite plants in the garden right now? Well, my favourites uh, have always been for a long time the forget-me-nots. Beautiful. Blue. Because they're, they're so friendly looking and they really like clay and they will self-seed. So they're, they're no bother. They don't look too bad when they go over. They're so reliable and they're just... They come up the right time to kind of cheer you up after the winter. And um, I just always really, really liked them. And I've seen a few in paving cracks as well, yeah. which I love because it's just, again, it breaks softening. things up, doesn't it? Yeah. yeah. And just that treat of that lovely colour blue. You're actually wearing <laughs> a very forget-me-not outfit today. <laughs> But also the, the hookahers that uh, look really vibrant at this time of year. Yeah, so the, lovely. The, the sort of, of course what colour would you call that? Um, it's a kind of red. Burgundy, red and burgundy yeah. sort of colour. And with the lush green of everything behind, yeah. it's just it's quite striking. But they do, yeah. it does look particularly technicolour. The yellow of the um, yeah, corners. Yeah, so it's nice, very nice. Big bush in the middle. Yeah. That kind of breaks up the green yes and um that's always interesting because it's got red bark in the winter and then you get gradually get the yellow leaves coming through yes it's so very nice that. that keeps everything feeling alive it's a bit like a burst of sunshine isn't yes. it there in the middle of all the green uh, and the yeah. the cotton balls tree snowball as we call it yeah i mean that's that, where, that big snowball tree there when I bought it, it was before we had this extra land, and it was a standard in a pot on the I it must have been tiny. Um, and well, uh, and I, that, and I decided to plant it out there, and bought a couple more since to go further along. It'll, um, it'll be wise. And it, it nearly died a few years ago. It had this sort of beetle that was destroying it. Uh, and... Uh, Ellie sprayed it for a few years, sort of at the right time. Oh, yes, you did. And it's recovered beautifully. Mm. It's magnificent. I can't believe that was a standard. Mm. It must have felt so constrained because <laughs> clearly <laughs> it wants inside all that restriction, yeah, yeah. It, was a, it was a massive flamboyant plant waiting yeah. to break and free. Some of the trees on the side beyond the pond are quite nice. I like those. They do catkins and all the rest of it, which are awful for sweeping up and everything <laughs> yes, but, but, but it. they're excellent for other purposes and uh, i don't know they're pretty trees i think mm. and the birds nest box we put in one of them and uh, i think we put them in for uh, wrens and, and you you got blue tits instead or something we did well i put them in for any bird really we, yeah. but their blue tits did um use it yeah, yeah. That's but uh, all, all the trees are wonderful
nostalgia. It ain't what it used to be. So last time I was here, Ellie and I were looking at the Mexican orange blossom and sort of smelling that gorgeous scent that they have. Mm. And you were saying that it made you nostalgic, it made you think of your aunt's garden in Bournemouth. Oh. And I thought that was quite an interesting comment. And mm. it just made me wonder about nostalgia and how those past memories influence our enjoyment and our choices mm. for our garden um, today. So I just wondered if you had any thoughts on that. Yeah, I mean, we've, we've specifically chose some plants because of the names. So I've got a, a Veronica after my aunt, and I've got, there's a Clematis Joe after my grandfather. And, um, you know, I've, I've been given presents from friends, including you. So every time I go around the garden, I see a, a plant from somebody. It's doubly enjoyable because not only is there a beautiful plant, but there's also the memory of the friend and, you know, how they came to give you this plant and everything. So it's, it's, it's always rich with meaning. It does rather, rather tempt you to um, buy plants that don't really go here. Because <laughs> you think of things from your childhood, you know, from a, a different garden. And when I was young, there were lots of rhododendrons and azaleas and camellias. Yes. And they thrived in, in the garden in Bristol. But they don't really do well here. So we've got one camellia in a pot just outside the red yeah lovely red flowers yeah yeah Yeah. and we've had um uh, geranium sort of uh, annual geraniums because i love that the smell reminds me of bournemouth my childhood in bournemouth but um they don't last and it just seems a bit of a, a waste to have this beautiful plant just for one year so i've sort of accepted that you know the garden has its restrictions and, and how about you, Rex? Have you got any sort of nostalgic associations I, with... I haven't, no, because uh, I moved around a great deal in my youth. So I didn't have a, a home that I would remember that things like plants and as a way at schools, you know. The garden is creating a new memory It is, for you. yes, it's wonderful. I love it, absolutely love it. And the front one as well is now looking really good, I think. The front garden at Skylarks is packed with colour, texture and charm, with a woodland cottage garden atmosphere. This needs to be a functional, practical space, with hard landscaping for the linear access driveway and a parking and reversing bay in between two semicircular flower beds. The planting is layered, with a tall conifer at the highest point, like the sentinel over the garden, then holly, cherry, mock orange, lilac trees, buddleia, quince and hawthorn, Vital hawthorn supports hundreds of wildlife species. Its leaves are the food plant for many caterpillars, its flowers are eaten by dormice, and it provides early nectar and pollen for bees. Jewel light -like red and pink roses punctuate the curved margins of the bed. There is wonderful feature foliage from shrubs and a beautiful acer. Architectural ferns fill shadier spaces and pretty flowers bring colour through the seasons. Heights are not graduated, but undulate throughout the beds, creating plenty of depth as the eye journeys around different layers of planting. There's just so much in there, and I love all your different layers as well, yes. which Ellie said to me was kind of accidental, but I don't yeah. believe you. But <laughs> it, you've sort of got your overstory tree, and then you've got the sort of mid-story yeah. plants, and mm. then the... Yeah, so that was planned a bit, though, how we made that tree stand up when it fell down in the great storm of 86 or whatever it, where, which when it tree? was. The, the one in the corner, the one from Bournemouth. <laughs> oh, right. Right in the corner. Yeah. Uh, and it, it, it fell over. It fell over. Well, yes, it, it had more than one sort of trunk going up and the one was almost flat somebody came and said should we cut it down for you and we said no we but we cut off 
some of the stuff that had fallen mm-hmm. to the take the weight off, off the off, rest. Yeah. And, and then the the, it gradually way. sort of pulled itself up. Is yeah. that, that big yeah. fur yes, that's yes, still yes. growing? Oh, wow. It was bent and crushed like that and right down. Gosh, in, in that right. big storm, you know, the big storm. In 87. 87, was it? 87, yeah. So it takes up quite a big chunk of the garden because it casts a lot of shade it's yes. very thick well when well, it came from Bournemouth it was about so high and so yeah. wide you know well, about so tiny just over a metre basically yeah. yes. yes, yeah. wow that's really gross so it's yeah. a bit like um, your snowball tree mm. you've obviously got the power to yeah. conjure up these <laughs> big right. beasts yeah. from yeah. and that of course plant. is nostalgic because it came from Bournemouth yes. my dad planted it oh really oh, yes. oh, oh I didn't know that I, oh, thank I, goodness I, I you saved it in his Rolls Royce oh life yeah <laughs> yeah, he had a Rolls Royce in those days. Wow. And he let me drive him all the way from Bournemouth. I couldn't believe it. <laughs> you know, like, backing a roller into that corner there. Like, you must have been terrified of scratching <laughs> them. No, I, I, I've been a driver ever since I was six, well, 17, I think I did it. Within two weeks of my birthday, I, I'd got a licence learning in Baker Street in London. In those days, you could drive without a, a licensed person with you, even a van driver I was at one time. You delivered to Buckingham Palace, didn't you? I've driven in Buckingham Palace. Really? <laughs> yes. <laughs> I've been in and through those both gates I've been in those. And I've been in the back with all the coaches and the art art gallery, wonderful art gallery there. Oh fabulous. Well anybody can go to that and see that. Yeah. The side of the palace. Yeah, but the um, the uh, layering you were talking about in the garden. Um, Mum planted the roses at the front, but they were doing really badly. So I thought they were going to die. So I, I cut them right back, thinking, oh, what well, now? We'll just have a clear view into the garden. But cutting them back revived them, and so now <laughs> they've come up, and now you've got sort of a, almost a border at the front of the garden. But you can still see through it. But that wasn't the intention. That sort of just happened. When I planted those roses, they went right the way round, like in a curve. They were, now they're intermittent. I mean, yeah. there's a, a small proportion have survived. Although I've noticed there are some gone. babies there now, so they may fill out. <laughs> well, oh. I mean, we, we have changed it occasionally, so it, it has looked different in yes, it, other, it other times. Yeah. So it's I mean, I had fine. a couple of hydrangeas at the top, but they didn't get enough water because the water came slow, you know, ran down. And I couldn't get out and water them often enough to keep them happy. Or if we went away for a month, they weren't going to do very well without regular watering. And then the beautiful cherry tree at the at the front, which is blossoming right at this minute. Yeah. We are lucky ever to see a single cherry because as a blackbird knows it's oh, there. Fantastic. And, and it, every year we see them little darling <laughs> taking all the cherries away just before they're ripe for us. The song of the blackbird makes up for it. <laughs> Rex's recollections of driving to Buckingham Palace were very apt because I'd recently read how when King Charles plants a tree, he clasps a branch in his hand, gives it a friendly shake and wishes it well. So I asked whether Gertie, Rex or Ellie ever interacted with a plant in a way that implies a relationship and reciprocal feelings. I definitely do. Like if I accidentally tread on a plant, I will apologise for it. (laughs) And um, I feel very responsible. If I bought a plant and and it doesn't do well, I feel like, you know, it's my fault. If if somebody else had chosen it from the garden (laughs) centre, it would be thriving somewhere else. I feel really guilty if I... If it doesn't do well in my garden, oh. and and we've been here for how very long? Sixty years in yeah. this house. Uh, so the the apple tree just outside the window is is more or less a member of the family. Uh, when we have to prune it, you know, and and it was old when thick. we came here. Yes, it was old when we came here. It's misformed and all the rest, and it provides us with wonderful apples and looks after the birds and everything. So it's, I think we feel, it's not just any old tree. Some of the plants, especially where I've planted them from very small, and they've yes, grown up, course, they're like my babies. Of course they would, yes. Um, you know, they're, they're, I do take it personally, you know. Um, 
I definitely w- would feel very sad when time comes to leave because, yes, they're, they're not just plants, they're my legacy, I suppose. Yeah, that's a really nice way of thinking of it. And how about you, Gersie? Do you feel the same way? Not, not to the same extent, I think, because I, I don't do too much of the planting anyway. You feel the same about the tree, though, don't about you? About the tree, yes. And, well, do you feel annoyed because you were um, pruning the roses earlier and don't you feel sometimes if the plant feels a bit evil if it's <laughs> stuck its thorn into you or not? Do you not feel that it's like having a bit of a go at you for... for she wears a they do seem respect. a bit ungrateful sometimes. Like, I'm doing this for your benefit so you grow nice and thick and bushy but, and you're trying to attack me with your super fine thorn. Skylarks is a very biodiverse garden, with its central meadow supporting a wide range of pollinators and birds in the summer. And as the UK's No Mow May gets underway, the lawn area and grass paths also have native wildflowers springing up. Bugle, which traditionally has many culinary and medical uses, is an important source of nectar and pollen for bees, moths and butterflies. A further consequence of foregoing mowing is that Rex's anchor is almost lost in a sea of grass. See, my anchor, nice. anchor is being... Um, swamped by grass. Swamped by grass. What is the origin of the anchor? The anchor came from a boat called the Lady Betty, which is uh, an ex-pilot's cutter for bringing ships in, into harbour. And, and it was made of teak, not, not ordinary wood, but really solid teak so wow. it's a strong um, boat uh, it needed painting at this time but this is just after the war but eventually it came up river seven to a place called hallow which is um, just north of worcester and there's a cabin at the front and a cabin at the back engines in the middle it was full of wonderful things and um, i played in, in that for many a year and even went down worked on seven in it and then spent the night in it a couple of times it's a wonderful boat so um, there is some nostalgia and, uh, in the garden for yeah you. it's just it's and, an uh, well, anchor I, yeah. I only just saw it through the grass cheeky <laughs> and and there's um it was parked by this um cottage, cottage which my stepfather had and uh, it eventually just sank of old age and they had to get a, then get huge machines to get the engine out because oh, of course gosh, it was full of weight, oil. So I can imagine as well, yeah, the oil. contamination from, yeah. from that. Yeah, terrible. Oh, gosh. Uh, anyway, so there were two anchors left and I decided I'd take one home with me. So oh, I heaved, heaved it across a field to the car and brought it home. It's literally an anchor because you're anchored yeah. to your old memories. Yeah. To, yeah. to that, yes. Yes, oh, that's really nice to know yeah. the story. Yeah. The water comes down the hill into our garden, yes. which is why it is so lush. Yeah, mm. yeah. The, the water all drains into um, a sort of a trough in front of the hornbeam hedge. I was really surprised to find that the, the daffodils were growing there. I would have thought their bulbs would rot from being left in standing in, water yes. all winter, but they prefer it there. <laughs> it's so bizarre. It is so curious. Sometimes you just can't predict, can you, no. what's, no, no. what's going to thrive. That's really interesting. Incidentally, while Skylarks has a large collection of butts to harvest rainwater, we love that Ellie dots decorative bowls and jugs around the garden to collect water. You may have spotted one or two, and when passing by on a dry day, a thirsty flower can immediately be provided with a drink. In May, following the earlier burst of cheery daffodils, Ellie's top tip for another super sunshine plant is yellow corydalis, one of Ellie's favourite, no-fuss, reliable perennial performers, flowering from May through to autumn, with bright tubular flowers and soft mounds of ferny foliage.
Thank you, Gertie, Rex and Ellie, for inviting us to your very special garden this May and for sharing your stories with us. We can't wait to visit you again as the summer season gets underway. And to everyone watching this video, thank you so much for joining us all. See you again soon.